to the stage. You get me first. Hi, everyone. By the way, this is for you. <laughs> So, today we're going to talk about reactive programming with RxJS in Node. Uh, but raise of hands first, how many of y'all have heard of reactive programming? Okay, like 75% of the people in this room. Yes! When I heard about it, I was like, I need to learn that thing, what is it? Um, well, how many of y'all practice reactive programming? That was sad. That's like 1% of the room. Maybe 10. Um, but... That's, uh, that's exactly why we're here, to talk about these exciting things. So, uh, like Peter said, I do things. I actually decreased it because I do too much. Uh, <laughs> I get a bit on the side, and then Ben does things as well. Um, and we're excited to be here today. So anyways, getting down to the point of what is reactive programming? Well, um, let's go through the Wikipedia explanation really quickly. So Wikipedia says, Reactive programming is a programming paradigm concerned with data streams and the propagation of change. This means that it becomes possible to express static or dynamic data streams with ease via the employed programming language, and that an inferred dependency with the associated execution model exists, which facilitates the automatic propagation of change involved with data flow. That was a lot of words. But in layman's terms, basically, reactive programming is just dealing with sets of events over time. And it's the automatic or implicit, not explicit, propagation of change. And each, each step doesn't actually know or care about the previous step. It just wants to perform an action to the inputs that are coming in when it reacts uh, and wants to react to the incoming change. So if you look at Excel, for example, sorry it's so bright, <laughs> wake up. <laughs> but um, I, unfortunately, in Google Slides, I couldn't figure out how to get a video to play, so strange. Um, but anyways, if you look at the first row, you have A, B, and C, and then D just concatenates A, B, and C, right? So it doesn't actually care what's in A, B, and C. And you can see that on the second row, I can change C to reactive programming instead of programming, and then all of a sudden D, again, this is this implicit propagation we're talking about in reactive programming. D is I love reactive programming now. So this is the basic, very fundamental explanation if people ever ask you, like, what is reactive programming? Um, another cool thing to realize is that reactive is just a fancy term for everything we all do. Um, it, no one actually invented it. It's just this name for the pattern of declaratively reacting to the propagation of change. Um, and you typically see reactive programming patterns when there's a really natural fit for events to be modeled as values over time. So network connections, HTTP requests, file system changes, et cetera. Now, we're going to talk about a few things today. We'll talk about reactive programming in Node, how to think reactively using RxJS in Node, and then the RxJS Node community. So let's talk about reactive programming in Node. So there's three, typically, types that you'd use for reactive programming in Node, and that would be promises, node streams, and observables. So if you look at promises, these were added to browsers around 2014, then added to Node around 2015, Included in the official ES2015 spec, um, they're push-based, single value, always async, um, eager, stateful, have a simple base API, and um, you have simple transformation options like then and catch. So overall, it's really easy to use. Um, here we're using a permissified read file, and in this case, my file contains an array of fruit snacks, because I love fruit snacks. Um, and then we're parsing the JSON that we get from it, presumably into an array, because on the next step, we're getting uh, the length of that array, and then we're logging it out to the console to say how many fruit snacks we actually have. Um, Note streams. So this ships with Node, of course, and there's four different types, readable, writable, duplex, and transform. Uh, these are push and pull, so you have to pull and say, hey, I want a value, and then it'll push a value at you. Um, really useful for managing back pressure. Um, multiple values, you can get multiple values, synchronous or asynchronous. Lazy, typically stateful. They have a complicated base API, and then there's limited transformation options um, out of the box. And if you look at it, so this is node streams, and basically we're doing the same thing that we did on the other file. Um, and we're 
you know, this gets a little bit hand wavy, as you can see. Um, but basically, you have to implement your own custom duplex streams to do the transformation. So this wouldn't be a very straightforward process, um, but it's a good example of how to use node streams. Observables, our favorite thing. So this uh, is currently TC39 proposal at stage one. Um, you can look at it on GitHub and comment on it if you like. Uh, RxJS is a reference implementation, implementation of the observable proposal. Um, observables are push-based and you can have multiple values. They are synchronous or asynchronous. Um, generally stateless, meaning you can just use them, reuse them just like functions. They have a simple base API, but they also have many transformation out of the box with something like RxJS. So this is an example of using observable. Um, we're doing the same thing as in all the other files, but here we're using bind node callback to convert the read file into a function that returns an observable, and then we're just mapping the values we get out of that and then logging the count out to cancel uh, the console again. So that's a little example of, again, reactive programming in Node, but let's talk about how to think reactively, because I think this is one of the biggest hurdles that people go through um, when trying to practice reactive programming. Um, and use RxJS. So to approach reactive programming, um, the more, most important thing to, is to think reactively, right? So in order to think reactively, you should start thinking of everything being modeled as an event, and the idea that all applications are actually event-driven, and um, everything, meaning any variable updated by an event, can actually be represented as a set of values over time, even events. Um, this is probably the biggest thing, right? Like, everything can be represented as a set of values over time, even event. Some people might say, but isn't that just streams? Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. So when we're talking about set of values over time, we're talking about um, set in the math sense. So you can have a set of A, B, and C. And then currently, the mindset is typically when an action happens, one thing happened. But the new mindset should be, OK, you should start treating events as sets of values. And, ex and example sets could be an empty set, set of zero, or a normal set that you would typically think about. Um, and then if everything becomes a set of values, then all of a sudden you can do so much more with your data and things get really exciting. You can query it, you can map it, filter it, join and combine things in different ways, um, give something half a set of things or things with a set of parameters, and life gets awesome. Um, so yeah, so again, digesting how to think reactively is really important um, as, you, as you go through and start using things uh, that some of these paradigms. Um, now let's talk about using RxJS in Node, which gets to sort of my favorite parts of this talk. Um, there's a lot of different implementations of reactive programming paradigms, but the reason why we love RxJS so much is because it's a domain-specific language for reacting to events. Um, and it sits on top of JavaScript, right? So you can learn this, and then you can take it through to any other job or any other framework or library you decide to use. It's also the most popular reactive programming library, so... Just like Kim Kardashian is so popular and we love everything she does. I'm just kidding. But, I mean, I do like her fashion choices. Um, <laughs> you should use RxJS. Okay, uh, there's also other dialects, which I think is really cool. So this is a very small portion of different dialects of Rx. So Rx Java, Rx PHP, Rx.net, etc. Um, so you can definitely check those out as well. But now I wanted to go ahead and introduce the person who just got glasses, Ben Lesh, to talk more about RxJS and Node. Thank you, Tracy. I'm, I'm glad I made it up on stage and did not trip uh, after getting glasses. <laughs> it does mess with my depth perception a little bit, honestly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what an observable is. Uh, observable, the, I'm gonna give you the simple, technical, nutshell version of what an observable is. Uh, observables are really just functions. So we're gonna kind of build up what an observable is uh, right here. So just imagine we had a function and I'm gonna call it my observable. Um, and to that function, I'm going to pass uh, an observer. So this observer is just an object that has a method on it like next. So if I call next with whatever value I want to put out of, in this case, a one, it's going to 
send the one out of the observable. Likewise, there's a, an error method on here. So if for some reason two equals one, then the end of the world has occurred, and we're going to tell everybody about that happening with our observable. And uh, we also have a complete method on our observer. So those are our three methods that, that uh, are going to exist on this object that we're passing to, the, to our function. And then to use this function, to use this observable, uh, we're just going to pass in just a plain old object that's got a next error and complete handler on it. And so what happens is this function is designed to set up something that's going to produce data. And it's going to uh, call next error complete. Uh, it's going to call next every time it has data that is produced and complete if it's done or error if it's had a problem. Another interesting thing about this is the function can return something. We can have it return another function that we can call to tear down the whatever's producing data. So it's just a tear down function. So this is right, right here we've kind of built an observable out of nothing but functions. So you might ask, why not just use function, functions, right? If I can just build this with functions, we don't need a whole like, library and a, a type for this. Well, there's, uh, there's some foot guns to, to using this as functions. For, like, for example, if I don't want to be able to call next after I call complete, if I say, hey, I'm done sending you data, and then I'm like, haha, just kidding, here's some more data. That's not, that's not very good. Um, other problems are, uh, well, our teardown, maybe it doesn't return teardown. Actually, the function I implemented there didn't return a teardown function, so we need to check that with like an if statement. Did you really give me a teardown or didn't you? If you did, I'll call it. Um, or, you know, what, what if you don't want all of the handlers or you don't care about handling every single one of these situations? Now I have to have if statements inside of my function to see if those, those handlers exist. Uh, likewise, it would be really nice if every time it erred or completed, it actually called the teardown, so we were more deterministic about how we were managing uh, memory with, with this. So what we can do is just take our function as it exists. Again, it's just a function that when you call it, it's going to set up something that is producing data. In this case, the, the setup is just the execution of the function of itself and, and funnel things out of this observer object. We can take it and just wrap it in this type called observable that handles all of those things for us. So it, it literally is the same thing. And when you call subscribe, rather instead of calling it as a function, then what we're going to do is we're going to call subscribe on it. And it literally just calls that function that you've wrapped in this observable type. So when you call subscribe, it's the same as calling a function. And it's going to take the object or the callbacks that you passed to it and wrap it up in a safer object we call a subscriber that has some guarantees around it, like I'm going to tear down, uh, I'm going to call your teardown logic if you've erred or completed. Uh, I'm not going to allow you to err twice. I'm not going to allow you to call next after you've erred or completed and so on. And then the other thing is it returns a subscription object, which wraps up whether or not there's an actual teardown underneath that. So if there's no teardown and you call unsubscribe, that's fine, it's a no op. But if there is, then it's going to call the teardown logic. So observables are just functions. So if, if you walk away with no other knowledge of, of what I've spoken about today, walk away with this. Observables are not some magical type. They just wrap a function and provide some guarantees. So the next thing to talk about with RxJS is what is an operator. Uh, when you hear people talk about RxJS, they talk about operators a lot. Operators are kind of the, the fun part of, of RxJS. Uh, really, an operator is just transforming an observable into another observable. So we have operators already that people use all the time in things like array. Uh, the word operator just kind of comes from the more uh, mathematical sense of dealing with sets of things. So a, an array is a set of things. An array can be queried with filter to make a smaller array. Or it can be mapped into a new array of things. Or you can chain them together and say, filter and then map. And at each step, it creates a new array, which is why you can kind of chain them together. We have the same thing with observables. It looks a little different because we're using functional programming to kind of pipe the operators together. But this is exactly the same operation. I'm, I've got an observable of the same values. So that's kind of like an array. It's just wrapped in an observable. And I'm taking those values, and I'm, pu I'm piping them through a filter operator and then a map operator. Um, and that's basically how this kind of works. The, each one of those things is executed as an individual step that doesn't really care about what happened before it, and they each produce their own observable. I still have to subscribe to it at the end, though. It doesn't do anything until you subscribe. 
So an operator, if you're going to try to implement one yourself, uh, looks like this. You've got uh, basically a function that, uh, it's a higher order function that returns a function that takes an observable and returns an observable. Um, right there. <laughs> The, uh, in, when you subscribe to the return observable, it's going to subscribe to the source observable. So that's kind of how it chains them together. And then what it's going to do is, in this case, we've, we've passed a mapping function in, and every time we get a value next to that us, we're going to call, we're going to call the mapping function on it and then pass the return value of that along to the next step. We also have to make sure to pass through our errors and completes if we're building a map operator. And there, you're probably not going to have to implement custom operators like this. There's a lot of operators in RxJS already. There's more than 60. Uh, that's a little intimidating to a lot of people. Some people go, oh, this is really hard. I can't do this. There's 60 operators. I have to memorize them all. No, you don't really need to memorize them all. Um, there's only a few that you probably really want to care about to, to start with. Um, and that would be these. You've got like map, filter. Scan, scan is basically reduce, only it emits the reduced value every single time. Uh, take, reduce, just reduces down and gives you the, the reduced value when it completes. Uh, merge map, concat map, sw switch map, those are all kind of flattening operators. I'm not going to get too deep into those. Uh, take until is interesting. You can use an observable to tell another observable when to stop. Um, and of course, there's catch error, which is to deal with error handling and mapping to a different observable if you get an error. So you can actually make new operators from other operators in RxJS uh, 6. So what you can do with this is you can just say, oh, I'm going to have my pow operator up here, and it takes some exponent value, and it's going to return a function that takes the source observable and returns a new observable. And you see I'm just using map inside of that other function because it returns an observable. Uh, likewise, I've got this less than um, operator I made, which is saying, oh, I'm going to make sure that this is less than some value. I don't know why I called it min. I should have called it max. That's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so and I can use that below and say, give me from this observable of these values, give me all the values less than 10 and take them all to the power of three. And uh, it gives me a, a set of results when I subscribe to that. So I just want to move on and talk about uh, special RxJS features that are, are really just for Node. Uh, so often I talk about RxJS for the browser, uh, but there are some features built into RxJS specifically for Node. Uh, one of these is bind node callback. So just as an example, here's a function that someone might write. Uh, it's not doing anything asynchronous. This should probably be asynchronous if it's a node operation. But basically, a node callback is this idea where you've got a function that takes a few arguments. And the last argument is some sort of callback. And the callback always has the first argument to it is an error if, if there is an error, or null if there's not an error. Um, and then the next argument is the actual result or there might be more than one argument that's in, that's, that are the actual results of the function. Uh, so here we've got this doubler, and it's saying, hey, if this is a number, then call the callback with an error. Otherwise, call it with null or in the, the doubled value. If I wanted to use bind node callback on that from RxJS, really what I do is I just call bind node callback with that function, and it, it kind of wraps that function in a new function that when you call it, calls the function and returns an observable of that gets the values out, or gets the error if, if there happens to be an error in there. So here is just an example of how I might be using like a read file, like a async read file with, I've got an array of file names, and I'm saying for every one of the file names, read the files and then just tell me the file name and the length of the content that's inside. This is just general uh, JavaScript node development. If I wanted to do the same thing with Rx and bind node callback, I could take bind node callback and wrap read file, and then I could just say, okay, well, I'm gonna, instead of having an array of these file names, I'm gonna have an observable of these file names. And I'm gonna take those and use a flattening operator to say, for every one of these file names, map that into an observable of this read file and get the content out of it and subscribe to that and get the output. So this code is gonna do exactly the same thing, pretty much, as this code. And you might think, okay, well, why? Why would I go through the extra hassle of using RxJS to do this if I could do it like this? Well, because now you can do something interesting. Because of this is reactive programming, and all the stuff in the bottom here, all this, this code here at the bottom, doesn't really care or know where file names is coming from. File names could be coming from anything. You could make file names come from a watch. You could say, okay, I'm going to use bind node callback on FS watch, and you could say, watch some directory, and every single time something in that directory changes, I want to get file names out of that. And then I'm feeding that into this exact same bit below, 
And every time a file changes now, you've got the uh, content length and the, uh, the file name printed. So all I did was just change the import. So that's one of the interesting things about reactive programming. Another feature that we've got built into uh, RxJS that's, that's not necessarily specific for Node, but has specific handling inside of it for Node is from event. Most people use this on um, event target, which is a DOM thing. So event target is if you get a button out of your HTML or whatever from the DOM, and it's got this add event listener, remove event listener interface on it, uh, it will, it, this, this allows you to say, oh, I know what this, this interface is. I'm going to pass it to from event, and I'm going to give it the event name I care about, and it's going to give me an observable of, of those events. This does the same thing with event emitters in Node. So if, you, if it implements add listener and remove listener, which a lot of things do in Node, um, you can actually use from event to get streams of, of data out of it. Uh, so just as a very simple example, you could say process on before exit. So pro a process, usually say, people say process on. Uh, process on is actually an alias for add listener. Uh, so this has add listener and remove listener, um, and you can, you can create an observable from that there. Uh, you can create an observable from streams, have uh, add a listener and remove listener on them. Uh, the uh, request object that comes out of an HTTP server has, has event, has, uh, event emitter implemented on it, so the same add listener, remove listener. So you can use it in a lot of places. Uh, so I want to move on and talk about the different things that are going on for Node.js in the RxJS community. Uh, there's, there's a few interesting projects. I'm going to highlight two of them. Uh, well, this one's pretty new, so bright. I'm sorry. Whoa. So now I have the glasses, it really focuses on my retinas, so that's good. Um, so Marble.js, uh, it's, it's a really, really cool project. Uh, they've done a bang-up job on their documentation. And what it is, um, is it, it just, it basically treats all your, an HTTP, HTTP server as an observable of requests coming in. And you're expected to map that into an observable of responses. So you can do all sorts of great reactive programming things inside of your HTTP service. So when you set something up with this, uh, it looks a lot like this. You, you set up some middleware, which I'm not going to go into. It's body parsers and loggers. It's the same sort of thing that you'd see in like an express app. Uh, but then you have these things called effects, which are your endpoints. And they can do other things as well. But usually, you'd probably use them for endpoints. And an effect might look like this, where you've got this observable of requests. And you're saying, hey, I want to map this into an observable of responses. So in this case, we're saying for all of our, our requests, just map it to the uh, response with the body of Hello World. So this is going to make our server into a big Hello World server no matter what endpoint you hit. Uh, but it also comes with other custom operators. So in this case, there is a match path and match type operator that we're bringing in from Marble.js. So this is saying for if, if the path happens to match uh, slash user, and it happens to be uh, an HTTP type of get uh, or of post instead of get or whatever. Uh, we're going to take the body out of the request, and we're going to pass it to some data access object, and then get the response out of that, and send that out of our our um, our body in our on our actual response. So this is going to presumably I don't know post some user data to your database or whatever when you use your data access object. So it's pretty cool, and you can do you can do other really interesting things with this. I mean, theoretically, you could say okay. Here's an endpoint where I want you to wait until someone else requests another endpoint of a different name and then respond. Like you could actually write something like that with this because it's reactive programming and that would be really weird to do with Express. It'd be hard to do something like that. You'd have some weird mutable state you'd have to deal with. Here's another bright one. Um, RxJS stream, this is, a, this is a cool little utility library for converting Node.js streams to observables and vice versa. Uh, so it's kind of cool because, uh, as Tracy was kind of showing with the, with the hand wavy slide about streams, dealing with streams can be um, kind of cumbersome in Node. It's got a, it's got a really uh, kind of eccentric API. They're powerful, but if you wanted to do some transformations with Rx because you really uh, understood it well or whatever, you, can, you could say, oh, I'm going to make this observable. In this case, I have an observable interval, so I'm saying every second, give me a value and just give me 10 values. And I can take that and convert it to a stream and then feed it into any standard stream thing. So in this case, I'm just sending it to process standard out uh, to, to kind of log it out to console. Um, but you can also go the opposite direction, where I could say I'm going to read a file uh, into a stream and then convert that into an Rx, uh, an Rx observable. So this string Rx, it actually does the job of, of dealing with the encoding. But um, 
And in this case, I'm saying, oh, I'm going to read this some file.txt, and I'm going to read every single character out of the file. And when I, when I hit the character A, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to take a count and say, how many characters were there until I hit a letter A? I don't know why you'd wrote a, write a program like this, but you could do something like that fairly easily uh, with Rx in this, this cool utility library. So just some key takeaways from this talk. Um, I'm sorry, the notes are very small in here. Uh, reactive programming is, uh, it's really about processing things in a set of independent steps. So when I say they're independent, that means that each individual like operator and each individual piece of it doesn't really care where the event is coming from that, that's triggering it. It just knows I'm waiting for some, some event to come in. If I'm a filter operator, let's say, I'm waiting for a value to come in, and when it comes in, I know what to do. I'm going to check it to see if it passes my filter and then send it along if, if it does. Um, RxJS uses observables to treat, uh, to, to treat events as, as collections. So observables are basically these collections of events or values over time. Um, observables are a type that, uh, again, this, observables are just specialized functions. So they're, they're this type that just wraps a function. They don't do anything until you subscribe to them. They're not, they're not prom like a lot of people try to compare them to promises. Promises are just different. They're multicast, they're, they're eager, they're not lazy. They, they're not gonna wait for you to call something on them. Observables are effectively functions you need to subscribe to to execute. Um, we have a few node specific features, most of the most, notably uh, bind node callback and uh, from events. And we've got some interesting projects uh, in, uh, in particular, I, I like that Marbles.js. I think Marbles.js is probably one of the more interesting things I've seen come out of the, the RxJS community re with regards to node. So, uh, and just real quick, um, this isn't a big takeaway, but there's, um, there's I, I have some work I'm doing on RxJS for the next version of RxJS. There's an experimental branch and the experimental branch is effectively a rewrite of what's currently there. It'll have the same public API, but it's about 40% of the current size. So that doesn't matter as much, I think, to the node community, but it will affect your spin-up time. It will affect your actual, like if you're building like an Electron app or something like that, like that it'll affect the size of your node modules, so it'll be good. Uh, it's gonna add support for async iterators. We might actually do this in Rx6 if we, if we have the time, but. Uh, async iterators are the result of your async function star, uh, what, what you're going to start seeing. I think people will start using that a good amount in Node especially. And we, we're experimenting with uh, panic mode in, in, in Node. So what this is, is generally speaking, uh, like promises, for example, will catch all errors that happen inside of, of them and they will send them down the, this special error path. And observables do much of the same thing. And in working, I used to, I used to be at Netflix before I was at Google. And I still, I still work with them, and, and folks at Netflix and other uh, node-heavy developer or development shops really would like a, a feature in a fancy uh, reactive programming library like this so that when there's an error, they don't have it caught in a try-catch. They'd rather just see an unhandled error immediately cause a panic and, and kill the process, and that way they can get better insight into what the state of the memory was, and they can look at the core dump and all these other wonderful things. So. Uh, we want to be able to opt into that behavior, and, and that's something that exists in the experimental branch, uh, which is based on callbacks, uh, which is a really cool project by Andres Feltz. It's, it's different, but it was in inspired by that. So you can go, out, you can go to that uh, URL there and check it out. There's a design doc that describes some of the decisions that are being made, and that's really cool. So that's it. Uh, here's a few links for you. When we send the slides out, you can follow some of these things. And I'd really, really like to thank uh, Tracy for leading us in. She's, she's awesome.